Hey, everyone. I know you know this by now, but just want to emphasize again that because this season of The City is about strip clubs, it's not suitable for everyone, especially kids. And that is especially true of this episode, which has a lot of explicit conversations, like very explicit conversations about sex. Okay, thanks a lot. Previously on The City. This is very much the land of opportunity here. Like, feels like freedom right here. Feels like freedom. Yeah. Yeah. I know that they provide jobs for a lot of beautiful families here in the Reno area and, and beyond. But at the same time, things have, there's a protocol that you've got to follow to, so that those people can go home safe and sound to their families or not, or not suffer ill effects from things they may have been exposed to down the line. They want to make me look like the bad guy. Who's the bad guy? I want them patrolled. I want them well lit. I want them in places where they cannot hide. They have nothing to go on. There's no records, there's no reports, there's no police act, there's nothing. So what do you do? Lie. That's when the undercover cop or said, oh, we need someone to sit on my buddy. And like, I'm just thinking like, okay, well, if I go sit on his lap, I'm for sure gonna get that dance. We got a deal. Heavy set girl in a red top. Heavy set girl in a red top. It's a busy day at the Reno Municipal Courthouse. The judge in courtroom B is plotting through a cattle call of cases. DUIs, domestic violence, car crashes. Stephanie is waiting in the gallery. It's been six months since she was cited in an undercover prostitution sting at the Spice House, one of Kami Kashmiri's clubs. This sting was bad news for Stephanie, but it's also central to the city's efforts to kick strip clubs out of downtown. Clubs they see as an obstacle to Reno's reinvention. I trust you too. Uh, yeah, just one moment, please, Mr. Thurman. Stephanie's actually feeling pretty optimistic. Kami Kashmiri's combative lawyer, Mark Thurman, is at her side. But more than that, she believes the evidence is on her side. She's certain that the secret recordings of that night at the Spice House will exonerate her. You know, it's all in the tape. Like, maybe it's not, yes. And so I was really confident... Remember, Stephanie landed in court because when an undercover cop asked if he could lick her in the back room of the club, she answered, quote, maybe. Fast forward to the middle of the trial, and that word maybe is now the focal point, as the prosecutor argues that maybe actually means yes, and Mark Thierman pushes the undercover cop to concede the opposite. When you asked if you could lick her uh, down there, didn't she respond by saying maybe? At one point, yes. She responded twice by saying maybe. I don't call the number, but yes. Does maybe mean yes to you? No. Stephanie's case hinges on this word maybe. But you could argue that the outcome of the larger battle between old Reno and new Reno also rests on an uncertain promise. Is Stephanie actually selling sex? Or is she selling a fantasy? In that same vein, how much of New Reno's promise is real and how much is just an illusion? And is the Reno City Council's real problem with old Reno the image of Cammie's clubs or the reality of what's happening inside? In our last episode, we looked at what it's really like to work in New Reno by taking you inside Tesla's Gigafactory. Now it's time to pull back the curtain on work in old Reno by looking at the jobs inside Cammie's clubs. And as it turns out, one dancer's maybe isn't the worst thing happening there. I'm Robin Amer, and from USA Today, this is The City.
When it comes to its campaign against the strip clubs, Reno didn't just conduct police raids or prosecute dancers. After the mayor said she wanted the clubs to be, quote, patrolled, well-lit, in places they cannot hide, the city unleashed an arsenal of inspections on Cammy's clubs. If the city couldn't kick Cammy out of downtown, it sure could make his life miserable. Here's our reporter, Anjanette Damon. It's January 2019. I'm sitting in the office on kind of a slow afternoon, if such a thing exists in the news business, when I get a text from Jeremy Cronick, the manager of the Wild Orchid. It says simply, code enforcement is here again. The Wild Orchid is just five minutes from the newsroom, so I jump in my car and get there just in time to see a parade of city vehicles leaving the club. Cammie's whole crew is gathered around the table in the back office at the Ponderosa Hotel. Cammie's in his usual spot at the head of the table. His brother Jamie's at the other end. Lawyer Mark Thierman's at Cammie's side. The managers of his three strip clubs fill out the rest of the seats. Calvin, the maintenance guy who takes care of the Ponderosa and Wild Orchid, is briefing the group on what the city inspectors found in their latest visit. All of this back area here is illegal. Every bit of it. The secret lounge and all these rooms back here is illegal. If the wall was gone and the booth was on the other side so you could see it from the main floor, oh, it'd be that fine. Going back to the plain sight thing? Screw that. I, that was Mark. Yes, the Reno City Council is trying to ban private rooms. But it turns out that even under existing code, back rooms are already illegal. But Mark says the back rooms in all three of Cammie's clubs have been there since before any of the laws took effect. So they must be allowed to remain. The city says otherwise. There are other issues, too. The curtain that separates the front from the back, the label, <laughs> the label says, not fire returning, right on it. He goes, well, you can't keep these here. Yeah, curtains that could burst into flames, that's a problem. Code enforcement also checked on the strip club's restrooms to make sure they were accessible to people with disabilities. Lucky for Cammie, the club was okay there. If it wasn't that, they was going to shut your doors down today. Literally, you're done. Cammie and Mark are indignant about all of it. Because the, they, they want to impose impossible standards for you to make a living so that you will sell the building and they can turn it into a parking lot, but at least they won't have to deal with it because of what's inside it. They're also starting to feel the pressure of all this scrutiny. Since the fight with the city started, the Wild Orchid and the Ponderosa Hotel, where Cammie's low-income tenants live, have been visited by Occupational Safety and Health Administration inspectors, city fire marshals, code enforcement, and the health department. Now, these visits were a legit use of government power, meant to keep workers and the public safe. And the inspectors found problems, which were detailed in extensive reports. OSHA, for example, found Ponderosa employees exposed to dirty needles, asbestos, and live wires. They fined the hotel nearly $13,000. And while Cammie's fighting those fines, he did spend money to correct the problems the inspectors found. Still, many of the problems found by inspectors had existed for years without the city seeming to pay them much mind. For example, cupboards in the Ponderosa that blocked fire sprinklers. And those curtains in the Wild Orchid, they weren't new. But suddenly, at the same time an effort was underway to kick the clubs out of downtown, the city was taking notice of these things. Typically, when fire inspectors would visit the Ponderosa and the Wild Orchid, they spend about an hour and a half doing their annual inspection. But last year, the inspector spent five and a half hours on site. Cammie saw these visits as baseless attacks on his business, attacks so aggressive that he started to believe there was an outlandish plot against him, a belief fueled by one city visit in particular. Let me take you back to the summer of 2018. The private eye has secretly been through the clubs. The city council has voted against them twice. And police and code enforcement have received their marching orders. So Cammy calls me up one afternoon with this wild story about the police poking around the Wild Orchid's basement in the early morning hours when no one is around. He's got them on surveillance video, he says. Come see for yourself. So I do. I meet Cammy and Jeremy... He's the manager of the Wild Orchid. In that Ponderosa back room, Jeremy lays it out for me. 
So on like 4.30 in the morning, whatever, a couple of cops come over and say, hey, we want to see the basement. And Gallup Front's like, mm, yeah, sure, whatever. So they come in and they end up in that wild orchid basement. The cops don't have a warrant, but the desk clerk lets them in anyway and shows them how to get downstairs. Jeremy shows me still images from the club's video cameras. Sure enough, there are two officers in uniform, shining their flashlights into dark corners of the basement. They're in there for about 10 minutes. Cammie is super suspicious. He finds the timing odd. So they purposely picked Sunday night, Monday morning, knowing the club was closed to go down in the basement. For We have that bug down there that we saw, right? Do you show her the bug? Wait, what? A bug? For a split second, I think Cammy might be talking about a cockroach or something. But no, he's talking about a black box kind of bug. He's not sure what it is, some kind of spying or listening device. Cammy's IT guy found it plugged into the building's phone system after the cops left. I want to see exactly what he's talking about. Maybe, do you, can we go down there with you and you can, now that I have this picture? Sure. What, is that okay? Yeah, of yeah. course. I'll show you exactly how it was. I'll show you how. Cammy is out of his seat in a flash, striding towards the basement stairs. I jump up and chase after him. He walks fast, talking the whole time about this IT guy, a guy who lives in the Ponderosa and takes care of the club's technology stuff in exchange for a break on his rent. He works for which company, Jeremy? I don't know, but he is a he is a, a tech head kind of guy. Yeah, he works for tech. We know, walk fast Charter. down the stairs leading from the Ponderosa back office and land in a shadowy hallway underneath the wild orchid. It seems to stretch endlessly into the dark. At our feet is just a bunch of junk, rat poison, tools, old pipe. I can't help but wonder, what the hell am I doing down here? Where is this leading? But I gotta keep up with Cammy. Off the main passageway are openings to cavernous side rooms that are full of artifacts from the building's past. Old furniture reminiscent of its days as a casino. That replica of the Greek statue Discobolus from when it was a nightclub. The building was originally a car dealership in the 50s. This is old. You know, at one time this used to be a Packard dealership. So they had Packards down here. A, a Packard? Packard. Like you know the, the car? car? Pa- yeah, Packard. Well, those days when you bought cars, you bought the parts and then they, they assembled them at the dealers and did all kinds of stuff. So they, yeah, this was an old Packard dealership. Wholesome Main Street car dealership, glitzy casino, pulsating nightclub. It's like running through a dim memory of Reno's past reinventions. Maybe in five years, this building will be a sushi burrito joint and hipster hotel. The stripper pole's abandoned down here beside Discobolus. We make it to a small control room of sorts. An alarm sounds when Cammy walks through the door. He points to a mess of wires and cables attached to the wall. But it was sitting right here. I have no idea what I'm looking at, to tell you the truth. Cables come in through the wall and plug into various routers for the club's phone and internet service. More wires run through a complex switchboard-looking thing that provides phone service to all the Ponderosa's hotel rooms. It's seriously old school. This is uh, this is like our switch panel. You know, it does the club, it does the hotel. It's all, you know, all our panels for our credit cards, for our internet. There's an old line from the novel Catch-22, one that Mark likes to repeat when he's talking about Cammy. It goes like this. Just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not after you. In this case, Cammy might be paranoid, but it doesn't mean that the city's not out to get him. I mean, the city did hire a private investigator to dig up dirt on him. It's the main reason I went on this wild bug chase to begin with. If a device was indeed installed by the police, it's in the perfect location. But I'm still skeptical. I mean, you really think that they were here to bug your phones, like the wild orchid phones or the ponderosa phones? or? Well, this is what we do know. They came in. And the guy that does all our work around here was down there a couple weeks ago. Said that was not there. That was transmitting a signal that none of us knew. Police aren't our friends. Okay, so what was Reno PD up to that night? I know the cops were in the basement. Cammy has video proof they were there, but no footage of them actually placing a device. So there should be a police report, right? Like the documentation of all the other city visits to the clubs. But the city has nothing in its files about this visit. The only thing it has is two seconds of tape from the dispatch center, noting two officers' location at the Ponderosa. So I call the watch commander and ask what they might have been up to. 
This is Lieutenant Joe Robinson. Let me pull up what we have going on there. The officers were hailed. Uh, They talked to somebody on the street claiming to be an informant of some type, said uh, that they were cooking meth and phenamine in the basement of the Ponderosa. (laughs) The officers, yeah. So here's the story from the police. Two rookie cops, Robinson says they've got a zeal to do good police work, were flagged down by a guy on the street who said he had information that someone was cooking meth in the basement of the Ponderosa. So the cops went to check it out. That's it. I asked him about Cammie's conspiracy theory. So I don't know if you're the person to respond to this, um, being a patrol lieutenant, but that Cammie Kashmiri is convinced that those officers planted a bug on his bug. phones. Yeah, his ID guy went down there after the officers left and found a router plugged into their phone system. Um, and he's he's convinced that the the officers are the ones that left that there. You know, I'm pretty sure that would be a federal offense to plant any type of bug or anything like that without going through the proper court channels. So I will answer to that. Robinson repeats the story of the officers trying to hunt down a meth lab, stresses that the desk clerk let them into the building, and says nine minutes is a reasonable amount of time to be inside. If Mr. Cashman or anyone else feels that the Reno Police Department unjustly planted a bug, I strongly recommend that he call the Reno Police Department Internal Affairs Division and have it investigated. Cammy never did file an internal affairs complaint. He thinks, why bother? With this new onslaught of enforcement, Cami sees conspiracies where there may be none. The real question, though, as it's been from the beginning, is the city's crackdown justified? Does it have good reason to go after Cami? Or is it just trying to find a way to bulldoze the clubs and make way for new Reno? After the break, Anne Jeanette finally gets some answers. If you paid the bouncer like half, you can have sex in the back rooms. Mm-hmm. Did you do that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I unfortunately got really involved in the prostitution part. The City is brought to you by Audible. Audible has the world's largest selection of audiobooks and audio entertainment. With the convenient Audible app, you can listen anytime, anywhere, and on any device, mobile, Alexa-enabled, Bluetooth, and more. So, whether you're at the gym, shopping, in the car, traveling, anytime you can't read, you can listen with Audible. As a member, you can easily exchange any title you don't love at any time. Plus, you get to keep your library of listens, even if you cancel. I usually gravitate toward nonfiction, and right now, I'm listening to The End is Always Near, Apocalyptic Moments from the Bronze Age Collapse to Nuclear Near Misses by Dan Carlin. It explores the question of whether humanity can handle the power of its weapons without destroying itself. It's really fascinating stuff, and you can listen to it for free on Audible if you sign up today. Start listening with a 30-day Audible trial. Choose one audiobook and two Audible originals absolutely free. Visit audible.com slash the city or text the city to 500-500. That's audible.com slash the city or text the city to 500-500. The private investigators that the city sent into Cammie's clubs documented touching, oral sex, and other activity that stretched beyond the boundaries of local law. They also suggested that drug use and prostitution were happening inside. But their report also raised a lot of unanswered questions. For example, those private eyes never made it into the back rooms. So what's really happening back there? Over the past year, Anjanette has tried to find out. To hear Mark and Cammie tell it, the clubs are spick and span. No prostitution, no violence, no underage drinking, no drug dealing. It 
does not happen. Cami can get worked up, as Cami often does, about this subject. Like during this conversation I had with him at the Wild Orchid one night. We've been here over 24 years. That's a lot of time, a lot of dancers, a lot of employees that have come and go through here that you could have gotten, that could have spoken one at a time about all the bad things that go on in these clubs, and they don't have one. Not a single one in 24 years. That's pretty damn amazing. But I wonder, is the reason no one has come forward really because there's nothing to come forward about? What if people aren't jumping up at council meetings or filing police reports or complaints because they're intimidated? Cammie doesn't buy that theory. They're just, why, what would they be afraid of? I'm, I'm not a criminal. I have no... I mean, what am I going to do? I'm not a crime figure. I mean, this isn't the Sopranos here. If his critics are right, if the club is a hotbed of prostitution and drugs and illegal activity, he says everybody would know it. Do you think if they had a real live person, they wouldn't parade that person all over town? They would. They don't have anybody because... There's nobody there, and there's nobody there because there's nothing going on. But I did find people. People who tell a dramatically different story. A story that isn't as black and white as the one Cammie likes to tell. So they, the managers and, and the Kashmiri say it doesn't happen. It absolutely... And they're fucking liars. They're liars. I've spent a lot of time in Cammie's clubs over the past year. I've shadowed dancers, hung out in their locker rooms, chatted with managers. I wanted to understand what these jobs in my community are really like, whether in the new economy or the old. So as I did with Tesla, I went looking for the truth. So the woman calling the Kashmiris liars is Tawny. Remember her? She's the former A-list dancer who was at the club when the cops raided safari nights in 2007. Tani worked at the Wild Orchid for about 10 years, until 2014, when she says Cammy kicked her out for being too loud and drunk too often. Tani says she never had sex with a client. That was a line she never wanted to cross. But what she did participate in, even made a business out of, were illegal buyouts. Here's how a buyout would work. A dancer would meet a customer who wanted to take her out of the club, say to go gambling or dancing or to have sex in a hotel room. But first, the customer would have to pay the club. You go up to a manager and he's like, I'm not going to let you leave unless I need girls. So that guy needs to pay $1,000 for you to leave. And literally, the guy would pay the club $1,000. It's a buyout fee. After he pays the club, the dancer is free to negotiate her own separate fee with the customer. Tani says it was a regular occurrence for her. She would go gambling with her customers or to fancy dinners, golf parties, even a military ball. Yeah, and I just made it a business. That's how I did it. For safety reasons, Tani took photos of her customers' driver's licenses before she left the club with them. And she built a network of Reno's casino pit bosses, VIP hosts, and limo drivers, who she could tip to make sure she wasn't in danger. And I'd get in the limo, and I'd hand a hundred through the window to the guy, and I'm like, you're on my ass all night. He's like, okay, what do you guys need? And I'm like, this guy just wants to go dancing and gambling. I'm staying on the floor. I said, make sure you have your eyes on me. Tawny often had to protect herself inside the strip club as well. She says she wasn't afraid to slap a guy or yell at him for groping her. It got her in trouble with the club managers who wanted dancers to be polite to customers. But she says it also kept her safe. It protected me because that kept me from being with a guy that could rape me or take advantage of me. So that kept that from happening. Tawny tells me that strippers couldn't always rely on the bouncers to protect them. Sometimes a customer could tip a bouncer to look the other way. Other times, a bouncer might look the other way because he wasn't being tipped enough by the stripper. They're supposed to be there taking care of you to make sure that doesn't happen, That's what we always said. And you only had, like, one out of every four bouncers that was truthfully taking care of you. That was it. 
Some of the dancers I talked to felt completely safe in the clubs. If a guy got out of line, they said all they had to do was get the attention of the manager or the bouncer and he'd be dealt with. I saw this myself at the Wild Orchid. Jeremy would intervene between dancers and patrons when they had an issue. But Tani isn't the only dancer I talked to who described buyouts. Other strippers independently confirmed that a guy could pay the club money to take a woman out of the club. And with as much time as Cami and Jamie spend in their clubs, Tani doesn't believe for a second that they were unaware it was happening. Also, some dancers I talked to said the clubs could be a dangerous place, particularly those private back rooms. Dancers told me about being verbally abused, groped, fingered, fondled, even drugged there. <laughs> Phil and I are meeting up for coffee with two former strippers who've transitioned out of the sex industry. There's like six inches of snow on the ground outside. But now we're sitting in Melissa Holland's warm living room. Melissa's the anti-sex trafficking activist we met briefly in episode one. She's working with PR maven Abby Whitaker and Mike Kazmierski to get the strip clubs kicked out of downtown. While Abby and Mike want the clubs gone to clear the way for economic renewal, Melissa is fighting the clubs on moral grounds. She believes what happens in the strip clubs, even the legal stuff, is morally wrong. She wants me to meet these two dancers she knows. Her organization, Awaken, helped them transition out of the sex industry. Jane and April, not their real names, say they worked at the Wild Orchid, April for 10 years until 2014, and Jane for six years until 2016. Jane says she also worked at Cammie's other two clubs from time to time. Jane started stripping when she was 16, homeless and a new mom. She was too young to get the required work card from the city, so she never did. But she said the managers at Cammie's clubs didn't care. Both women described scary situations inside Cammie's clubs where money reigned supreme. Here's Jane. If you pay enough money, you yeah. can basically touch and do whatever. Mm -hmm. Especially in the back rooms. There's mm -hmm. like so much happens in the back rooms. And I mean, people would come out with black eyes all the time from those rooms. Mm -hmm. um, and they, here's some alcohol. You're going to be okay. Like, mm -hmm. here's some makeup. The house mom, like, mm -hmm. always, like, here, I have some extra makeup to cover that up. Oh, my. April says her friend was choked in a private room, and she herself was once drugged at the club. I had one drink, and um, just holding onto the walls, trying to make it down to the, the um, dressing room. And the girl saw me just laying on the floor, and they just assumed that I was wasted, and nothing was done. April tells me pimps would often prowl the wild orchid. Were you ever approached by guys that seemed to be like pimps? Like, oh all the time. And how would they approach you? Oh, they come over and they're like, hey girl, you're beautiful. You know, we can make some good money together. And I was like, go fuck yourself, personally. Jane wasn't so lucky. She says she fell victim to a group of pimps when she went to a party at another dancer's house. She says they beat her up and raped her. She never went to the police because she said she was afraid the pimps would kill her. They told her they had an in with the police department and would know if she reported them. To avoid beatings, she said they told her she had to earn them a certain amount of money each week. To be clear, these pimps weren't associated with the strip club, and Jane didn't meet them there. I talked to several women who said they saw prostitution happening at the club, but Jane is the only stripper I talked to who said she was coerced by pimps. Jane said she would help fill her quota in Cammie's clubs. She also worked in the brothels outside of town, including the Mustang Ranch, Lance Gilman's brothel, and picked up clients from online escort services. It's all part of the ecosystem of sex work in Nevada, both legal and illegal. The ecosystem backers of the new Reno are trying to dismantle. Even though he's been adamant he's not aware of it, it seems pretty clear that solicitation for sex happens inside Cammie's clubs. Jane, April, and other current and former dancers shared similar stories about customers offering money for sex. Some, not all, take them up on the offer. If you pay the bouncer like half, you can have sex in the back rooms. Mm -hmm. Did you do that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I unfortunately got really involved in the prostitution part. 
Melissa Holland's organization Awaken also hired a lawyer, Jason Guanasso, to take sworn statements from women who worked in Reno strip clubs as part of some early groundwork for a potential lawsuit against the clubs for poor working conditions. As of today, Jason hasn't filed any lawsuits. So although the statements were taken under oath, they have not been filed in court or subjected to any kind of scrutiny by opposing lawyers. Mark Thurman told me he's never seen them. I joined Jason at his law office in South Reno to listen in on one of those statements. Raise your right hand, please. Alrighty. He's interviewing a former door girl from the Wild Orchid and Fantasy Girls over the phone. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. The door girl says drugs were sold and prostitution happened at Cammie's clubs. She says sometimes women were fined by the managers for engaging in prostitution. Sometimes they were fired. That was up to the managers, the door girl says. But their primary concern was not about the dancers. Um, As long as they were making money, there really wasn't a... They didn't really interfere in anything. Okay. So the main concern of management was whether the club was making money, not whether people were abiding by the rules or the laws. Is that right? (laughs) That's very correct. Jason also interviewed a former stripper. She didn't want to be recorded, but Jason shared the transcript with me. She says she worked at the Wild Orchid, but left about a year after the Safari Nights raid, so more than 10 years ago now. She also described dangerous situations in the private rooms. And just a quick warning here, it's going to be a little graphic. Dancers would be masturbated on, They'd have to fight off men who tried to, quote, stick their hands inside of them. Everybody just dealt with it, she said. The dancer also said that she was drugged and raped in a private room at the Wild Orchid. She never reported it to police. Jason asked her why. According to the transcript, she answered, I think you don't think anybody will believe you. I know for me afterwards, I thought it was my fault. And because you choose to work somewhere like that, who's going to listen? It's time to talk to Cammie about everything I've learned. So field producer Phil Corbett and I returned to the Ponderosa Hotel. It's been almost a year and a half since I started reporting this story. I've interviewed Cammie a dozen times or more. He's always been open in a way that city attorney Carl Hall or the folks at the Giga Factory are not. But now I'm walking in with stories of women whose experiences inside Cammie's clubs are vastly different than what Cammie and Mark describe. Multiple women told me detailed accounts of similar dangers they faced on the job. Those stories lined up with each other. But I don't have any documents or anything like that to back up their stories. I'm nervous about how this interview is going to go. I first ask him about the illegal buyouts, when customers allegedly pay the club to leave with a dancer. First of all, we don't do buyouts. Okay, so you're saying these women are lying about buyouts. These women, they didn't happen. I'll tell you our issues with these buyouts. First of all, our buyouts, we don't do buyouts. Why would I allow that? I want everything to happen here. I can make my money here, right? Here. Why would I want them to leave to go anywhere? Why? I mean, is it possible that you had managers or floor guys that let that happen? I mean, I just don't, you know, Tani seemed really credible to me when I talked with her. Like, she was very detailed about her experiences and, you know, this other deposition kind of backed that up, so. You know, you know, they can, anybody can say anything. But then he backtracks a bit on his denial about the buyouts. If they happen, he says, he fires the dancer. Uh, the dancers meeting outside the club every once in a while, yeah, I've heard that. And that's why we, we, you know, it's at the point where we may even have a higher private investigator come in the clubs and just act like a customer and try to get the girls to meet them outside the club. You've done that? We are, we've been talking about doing that, yeah. Because I want to make sure they don't meet customers outside the club. Because that's the part I can't control. It's hard because they go home. It's a little ironic that Cammy is thinking about hiring a private eye so soon after the city hired one to spy on him. Prostitution, drugs, illegal activity, 
That all puts his strip club empire at risk, he says. He'll do anything to protect his licenses. So he says he has checks and balances in place. Like, dancers can call a hotline anonymously to complain about club employees. But dancers tell me they don't really trust it. Cammy says he relies on his managers to deal with employees who steal or allow prostitution, but acknowledges it's hard to find managers he can trust. If he does find out people are doing anything illegal, he says he fires them on the spot. Several of the dancers I talked to back this up. Remember, Stephanie was adamant she didn't engage in prostitution. She said it would have been a quick way to lose her job. But in this interview, Cammy seems pretty dismissive about the dancers' safety concerns. Black eyes in the back room? Impossible, he says. And here's when things get a little weird. He starts telling me that the dancer is always in the, quote, power position during a lap dance. He tries to demonstrate for me as he's sitting in his office chair. He pushes away from the table and kind of slides down in his seat, spreading his legs open as if he were about to receive a lap dance. He motions as if he wants me to stand over him, like I'm the stripper. I decline. He keeps talking. Because the dancer's the one that's, she's, it's her, it's her game. It's her rules. She's, I'm sitting here. I'm not up. I can't, I'm, what can I do sitting down? Oh, I think I would be a little afraid. <laughs> You're standing above me, I mean, Anjanette. Yeah, I know. You can hear me laughing nervously at this whole absurd exercise. Cammy may be sitting, but he's still a huge man. There's no way I could defend myself, even if I'm the one standing. He sees the look on my face and seems to realize he's larger than the average guy. I know. I don't care. First of all, I'm not your average customer. No, you're right. But, you know, you're the one sitting here, so I'm thinking about this. Okay, scenario. I'm sorry. What was your name? Phil. Phil. Phil's sitting down and you're standing up. Okay? Who's in the power position? Not Phil. You are. You determine the rules of this game. Not, not Phil. You. But who really has the power here? The dancer, who can be replaced by another one looking to make some cash? The bouncer, whose level of protection may be based on how much he's been tipped? I am not at all convinced that a dancer would be safe from a guy who wants to do her harm, simply because she's standing over him. Cammy insists that the bouncers would throw out any customer who is abusive toward a dancer, or at least tell the guy to knock it off. But then he switches gears, and suggests that the bouncer's job isn't actually to protect the dancers, it's to protect the club. It's not the customers we have the issue with, it's our dancers we want to make sure everybody follows the rules. Cammy says the strippers I talk to are straight up lying. And he says because the police have no record of assaults on dancers, nothing's happened in his clubs. These are all lies. Go look at the police. Again, if this girl came out with a black guy, no, if these say. girls were assaulted, you call the police department and you say, I was assaulted, and they come down here, we can't stop her from calling. They say they say they don't call the police because they're worried the police won't believe them. Oh, come on. Show me a police record, show me a report, and then I will justify it. But I'm not going to sit here and, and waste my time. i got to go work out. My girlfriend's waiting for me right now. Over what some dancer 10 years ago said because she's pissed off because who knows why she's mad. Cammy's right, it is difficult to find a police record. The strippers have already told me they don't call the police. And now Cammy mocks me for listening to the strippers. It's a move that seems to play right into that fear women have that they won't be believed. Here you come with the great fictional, the great fictional stories. And you just wasted your time on a bunch of nonsense. With that, he's pretty much done with me. He's ready to hit the weights. We're done? Okay. I can yeah. go work out. But we know from one guy that Cammy isn't telling the whole truth about buyouts. That guy is Mark Thierman. I talked to him briefly on the phone about three months after my interview with Cammy. I asked him whether the club had once done buyouts, but stopped doing them because the city was ramping up pressure on the club. Mark confirmed that's what happened. And then the buyouts, like it sounds to me like you guys, it was a regular practice, and so maybe you clamped down on it after this whole city yeah. council thing no, it started. Was. I mean, the theory is that the girl comes to you, the manager and says, I want to go gambling with this guy. He's going to buy me out. Nobody says, I'm going to have to go to the hotel room with him. Um, if they do, that they're that's silly. And what are you supposed to do? Say no. I'm, and the house makes money on it. Everybody's kind of happy. It goes on its merry way. I guess 
now it's coming home to roost that well you know they didn't go gambling they just went out and, and had sex or didn't have sex still even when confronted with his own lawyer's comments cammy refused to acknowledge buyouts happened in a text message to me he said mark is not involved in club operations and had never personally witnessed a buyout if dancers are being hurt in the private rooms then the city has good reason to crack down on the clubs, especially after ignoring them for so long. But when the city finally takes action, it doesn't go after the pimps, or guys abusing the dancers, or the bouncers looking the other way. It goes after Stephanie. After the break, we return to Stephanie's trial. Hiring can be challenging but not with our sponsor, ZipRecruiter. When you post your job on ZipRecruiter, they don't depend on candidates finding you. They find them for you. That's why Gretchen Huebner, co-founder of Codable, turned to ZipRecruiter when she needed to find a game artist for her education tech company. ZipRecruiter's technology identified people with the right experience and invited them to apply to Gretchen's job. She said she was impressed with how quickly she found qualified applicants. She also used ZipRecruiter's screening questions to filter her candidates so she could focus on the best ones. And that's how Gretchen found a new game artist in less than two weeks. With results like that, it's no wonder four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. See why ZipRecruiter is effective for businesses of all sizes. Try ZipRecruiter for free at our web address, ZipRecruiter.com slash the city. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash T-H-E-C-I-T-Y. ZipRecruiter.com slash the city. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. Okay, let's go back to Anjanette, who's in the courtroom waiting for Stephanie's trial to start. Stephanie is sitting quietly at a table in the front of the room, her hands in her lap. Mark Thierman, wearing one of his many Darth Vader ties, is sitting next to her. A little earlier, I saw Cammy here, too, in his trademark athletic wear, but it took too long to get to Stephanie's case, and he left hours ago. The city prosecutor is Angela Ginoli. She has a commanding presence. She works for Reno City Attorney Carl Hall, the guy who secretly hired the private investigator to spy on the clubs, the guy whose office has built the case for ousting the strip clubs from downtown, the guy whose own building is for sale a block away from the Wild Orchid. The judge in the case is Tammy Riggs. She jumps right into it. Will the, the uh, witnesses who are going to be testifying stand up and raise your right hand right now? And, Marshall, will you please swear in the witnesses? You also want to swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you, Ms. Ginelli. Who's your first witness? Detective Wesley Leedy is called to the stand. He's the undercover cop who got Stephanie that night at the club. He still got that big, bushy beard that made Stephanie think he looked like Bradley Cooper in American Sniper. What follows is nearly two hours of some really squirm-worthy testimony. Detective Lady describes how Stephanie, wearing her red lingerie, sat in his lap. How Serenity, Stephanie's loud partner at the club, told a lewd story about things that happened in the back. And how he asked Stephanie about what he might be able to get in the back. Then the court's attention turned to the oral sex incident, or the simulated oral sex incident, depending on who you ask. You might remember from the undercover tape, this is the moment when Serenity dove her head between Stephanie's thighs as the pair tried to talk the cop into a private lap dance in the back. The detective testifies he believes Serenity was actually performing oral sex on Stephanie. And based on her positioning and behavior, it appeared as though um, some form of oral sex is being performed. Objection relevance. Judge, this is 100 percent relevant. Yeah, objections overruled. Mark keeps objecting to this whole line of questioning, but this interaction between Serenity and Stephanie is a key moment for the prosecution. Was it part of the sales pitch for sex, as the prosecutor argues, or was Stephanie just selling the fantasy, as Mark maintains? Both sides spent an inordinate amount of time asking for the most minute details about this incident. How were the dancers positioned? What angle was the cop viewing it from? How many pairs of underwear was Stephanie wearing? Did Serenity move them aside? 
Did anyone actually see any tongue? Mark's like, look, this is all theater. This is all designed to entice a guy to spend more money in the club. There's no real expectation that sex will actually happen. The dancer will get fired if it does. This whole display by Serenity and Stephanie is just part of the wind-up to a lap dance. Mark even tries to shame the detective for falling for the shtick. These are actors. They act for a living. They act like they're having fun. You're telling me based on that acting, you were fooled into believing... I'm going to object. This is becoming argumentative. Is there a question here? Um, He's getting to it. Overruled. Go ahead, Mr. Thurman. Are you telling me you were fooled into believing they had oral sex? I'm going to object as the characterization that he's fooled into believing. Overruled. Ask your question again, Mr. Thurman. The detective doesn't have time to answer that question before Mark moves on and asks him something else. Ultimately, this case hinges on the word maybe. Stephanie was doing her best to earn a living and play by the rules. But the rules here are ambiguous and constantly shifting. It's almost as if Stephanie is the rope in this tug of war between the strip clubs and the city. The detective seems to be getting more and more uncomfortable with all this sex talk. And at one point, the judge stops the entire proceeding and admonishes everyone for talking like embarrassed middle schoolers during a sex ed class. We had, this is a court of law. We're all adults here. Let's just hear what was said. We don't need to be using euphemisms or, every, or anything. Let's just please put it out there. What was said, what was done. Finally, the prosecutor gets the cop to explain what happened in grown-up terms. After she had already indicated that she would allow me to lick her in her vaginal genital area, um, only if I were to get her wet enough, I then confirmed with her that um, I could do this act in the back room with her for her originally listed cost of $150. And did she agree to allow you to go back to the back room and lick her vagina for $150? Yes. Mark says, whoa, 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 hold on here. Stephanie didn't say, sure, I'll go in the back room and let you go down on me. When you asked if you could lick her uh, down there, didn't she respond by saying maybe? At one point, yes. She responded twice by saying maybe. I don't recall the number, but yes. Does maybe mean yes to you? No. But the prosecutor is ready with an argument that maybe actually does mean yes. Now, if you listen to the voice inflection by the defendant. This wasn't a tentative maybe. She was not pensive about this. It was coyness. It was this cat and mouse game, the thrill of the hunt, so to speak. This was not a maybe. This was a yeah, maybe. This was flirtatious. This was a yeah. If we go back there, you can lick me. To me, this is where the city gets into some really backwards thinking logic. Logic that doesn't seem to square with this whole shift in the national conversation about consent. Maybe means yes? I mean, what if this were a rape trial? If the suspect tried to argue that the victim said maybe just before he assaulted her? Stephanie is sitting at the table fuming. What, what were you thinking yeah, when she was... I was so angry that they were trying to paint me as this person. Like, like I was... They kept trying to like be like, oh yeah, she was enjoying this, she was being flirty. But yeah, okay, you have to do that at the job. And if I didn't act like this, I'd be boring. The trial lasts for about four hours. By the time we get to closing arguments, it's dark outside and stomachs are grumbling. When the lawyers are finished, the judge leaves to deliberate. She gets back more than a half hour later and launches into a meticulous explanation of her decision. We all know that this is a theater and I think what, that uh, what he's saying as far as, uh, you know, the, the name of the game is to step up to the line and not go over it, I think that's true. Um, what, you, what I have concluded and what you have probably um, gotten from what I've, uh, my comments so far is I have concluded that that line has been stepped over, but I do want to let you know what my conclusion is based on, so I will proceed. This is the moment Stephanie realizes she might be in trouble. To the judge, the entire production that night at the Spice House is a sales pitch for sex. The dancers' actions, the sexy stories and simulated oral sex, outweigh the word, maybe. That's sexual conduct, clearly. 
that, again, is not the charge conduct in this case. It's simply part of the sales job for whatever comes later. But um, it's clearly sexual conduct. But the judge seems to have some empathy for Stephanie. She says Stephanie likely had no idea that what she was doing was illegal. Mark even argues that this is all part of the normal course of business in a strip club. It's what the club expects of dancers. Sweet talk the guys, but don't actually do anything in the back. The club even has dancers sign a document before every shift, promising not to engage in prostitution. It just seems like that is a uh, document that is intended to protect uh, the management, as we're going to see it didn't protect um, it didn't protect the defendant in this case, and that's that's really, it's too bad. That's when Stephanie knows she's done. Like, when she said that, I knew, like, she was going to say guilty, and so that just, like, broke me. All that innuendo, all that walking up to the line, to the judge, that was brokering a deal. Whether she was going to change her mind, whether she was going to, um, whether, you know, she was going to disappear when he came back. It doesn't matter because she's made an agreement. And I find that that agreement has been proven beyond a reasonable doubt. I do find you guilty of soliciting for prostitution. In the courtroom, Stephanie drops her face into her hands and for the first time that day, begins to cry. Although the judge convicted Stephanie, she only fined her $8. Judge Riggs says the clubs, who are making money off of this, should be responsible for training their dancers on what actually constitutes solicitation. But to Stephanie, the small fine was little consolation. Any solicitation conviction would make her ineligible for the city work card she needs to strip in Reno. Do you feel like the city was hard on you to try and make a point about the clubs? Yeah. They're still just trying to push it because they want to get that win. Like, they don't care. She's appealing the case and hanging on to the hope that the next judge sees it differently. I'm just, like, praying that, you know, the next judge will be, you know, like, will actually see that, you know, I didn't do anything wrong. And I don't know. It's just, um, I just... I don't know. Yeah. It's a scary position to yeah. be in. Reno strip clubs can be dangerous places for women. And the way the clubs expect them to do their jobs can run them afoul of the law. But rather than protect them, as the city cracks down on old Reno, it seems to be punishing the dancers most of all. Stephanie's conviction could be used to bolster a case to move Cammy's clubs, but it won't be the main factor in his livelihood not the way it will be in hers. In next week's episode, the Reno City Council decides the fate of Cammie's strip clubs. What do you think is going to happen in there today? You know, the way these meetings go, I, I couldn't tell you. Honestly, I have no idea. We come here, we fight, and we'll fight, and we'll fight. And we learn what that outcome means for everyone caught up in the battle over Reno's future. Even if it hurts, you still walk until you can't walk no more. That's next time on the season finale of The City. The City is a production of USA Today and is distributed in partnership with Wondery. You can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening right now. If you like the show, please rate and review us, and be sure to tell your friends about us. Our show was reported and produced by Anjanette Damon, Phil Corbett, Camille Stanley, Taylor Macon, and me, Robin Amer. Our editors are Amy Pyle and Matt Doig. Ben Austin is our story consultant. Original music and mixing is by Hannes Brown. Legal review by Tom Curley. Launch oversight by Shannon Green. Additional production by Emily Liu, Sam Greenspan, Wilson Sayer, and Jenny Casas. Brian Dugan is the Reno Gazette Journal's executive editor. Chris Davis is the USA Today Network's VP for Investigations. Scott Stein is our VP of Product. And our president and publisher is Maribel Wadsworth. 
special thanks to Liz Nelson, Kelly Scott, and Alicia Barber. I'm Robin Amer. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at The City Pod, or visit our website. That's thecitypodcast.com. Hey, thanks for watching. If you like this video, check out these other videos from USA Today to stay up to date with all the latest news.